John Sanford Smith is an ophthalmologist who served for 21 years as consultant ophthalmologist at the Leicester Royal Infirmary and as honorary clinical tutor to the University of Leicester. Today, we honor him both for his medical services in Leicester to patients and to our students and for his work in some of the world's poorest and in some cases, most dangerous places. John read medicine at Cambridge. After graduating in 1961, he hoped to find a job teaching at one of the new universities in sub-Saharan Africa, but no such post emerged. He therefore, at the suggestion of a friend, decided to serve for a year as a volunteer at the Christian Mission Hospital in Quetta, a Pakistani city close to the border with Afghanistan. He drove overland to Pakistan in a second-hand Land Rover and soon immer immersed himself in the work of the hospital. Among the features that engaged him were the so-called eye camps, which were pop-up surgical eye units in rural Balochistan, the poorest province in Pakistan. He also began to learn Urdu, the first of many languages in which he learned to say, open your eyes. Towards the end of this period in Quetta, a job came up in the Nigerian city of Ibadan, and John was able to revive his plan to work in Africa. He returned to England, married his girlfriend Sheila, who's with us today, and together they went to Ibadan, where John worked as a surgical registrar at University College Hospital, which was then the only teaching hospital in West Africa. In 1966, John returned to England to begin postgraduate training in Bristol. In the interval between his registrar and senior registrar posts at Bristol, John returned to Quetta, this time for three years as specialist ophthalmologist and surgeon, and this time with Sheila. By the time he returned, he had become fluent in Urdu, a language that was in due course to be useful for his interactions with patients in Leicester. At the end of his postgraduate training, John chose to return to Nigeria, this time to serve for four years as consultant ophthalmologist at Amadou Bedou University Hospital in Kaduna. In Nigeria, he began to publish, notably on herpes simplex keratitis, a condition that damages the eyes of young children with measles. After four years in Kaduna, John turned, returned to England to take up a post as consultant in Leicester. He had spent nine of the 18 years since he graduated in overseas work amongst the very poor. For all but the first of those years, John was accompanied by Sheila, and they were raising a family. One of their four children was born in Pakistan and another in Nigeria. All four are with us today. Our purpose today is to honor John, but we cannot do so adequately without acknowledging the importance of Sheila. She has tire tirelessly supported John in his work for the disadvantaged, raising a young family overseas, and continuing to support and understand the value of, his, of the journeys he makes in his late 70s. John dedicated one of his books to, to Sheila, my wife, who has brought up a family in three different continents and 12 different homes and hardly ever complained. The move to Leicester did not involve any diminution of John's commitment to third world medicine. He managed to spend at least a month a year overseas, not by applying for grants, but paying his own expenses and accumulating the time off by consolidating two weeks of his annual leave and one week of study leave and by being on call on all bank holidays and at Christmas. After he retired in 2000, the time that John spent overseas quadrupled. Throughout the 16 years of his retirement, he has worked in a direct surgical role in many developing countries. For most of those years, he has made annual visits to Yemen, India, and Burma. In his retirement, his surgery and his development of ophthalmological training product, projects have also taken him, sometimes repeatedly, to Bangladesh, Benin, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Gambia, 
Ghana, Malawi, Nepal, Pakistan, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and Uganda. In these countries, his expertise has been of huge benefit, not least in training others in the inestimably valuable technique of small incision cataract surgery. John has carried out up to 50 cataract operations in a day, but he is also a dedicatedly patient teacher of all grades of ophthalmic worker, not just doctors, but nurses and paramedics, and has played a particular role in training nurse cataract surgeons whose surgery is helping to remedy the, the shortage of doctors in rural areas of several African countries. Beyond all this, there are two more important conversations, there are two more important uh, contributions. First, there is a pair of textbooks, Eye Disease in Hot Climates and Eye Surgery in Hot Climates. Both are written in simple English because their readers include many for whom English is a second language. Both have been translated into a similar register in French, the other important international language in sub-Saharan Africa. Both have been read in large numbers by health workers all over Africa. The second contribution is technical, not the ever more complex equipment used in the developed world, but rather the equipment that practitioners in developing countries can afford and maintain. Eye doctors need ophthalmoscopes, and they typically cost about 100 pounds, which is far beyond the resources of health workers in poor countries. In the Christmas 2000 issue of the British Medical Journal, there was a light-hearted article about an ophthalmoscope made of silver paper and a rolled-up tube of cardboard. This article sparked a sequence of events that culminated in John tracking down a very able optometrist called William Williams, who as a result of John's briefing, designed the ophthalmoscope now known as the arc light. This is a robust and durable tool. It uses LED lights, so there are no filaments to blow. It can be charged with solar power. It can double up as an instrument for examining ears, and it costs just over five pounds. John and a colleague secured £100,000 from the Fred Hollows Foundation, an Australian NGO, to develop and, and produce the first 10,000 instruments. The effect on eye health in developing countries promises to be transformational. The qualities of the arc light, robust, durable, and transformational, might justly be said to characterize the life of John Sanford Smith, which has been wholly dedicated to transforming lives, including, including the lives of the poorest people on earth. It would be difficult to think of a nobler way of living a life in medicine. Mr. Chancellor, on the recommendation of Senate and Council, I present John Henry Sanford Smith that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Science. And I like it when people get it in their 70s as well. Terrific, absolutely. Uh, you'll be able to give that to you. Uh, well done, indeed. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, and members of the Senate, uh, thank you very, very much for this great honor. I feel uh, somewhat overwhelmed uh, and overawed, as you might imagine. Um, two weeks ago, I was in rural Bolivia, uh, in, in the Amazon, looking at some eye patients, and it was a lot easier than it is standing up uh, in a situation like this. I particularly would like to thank uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Gordon Campbell, um, he's our neighbour just up the road, um, for the nice things he said about me. Uh, you may know, some of you may know, that he actually also gave the uh, oration for the good King Richard III. I think, apart from sharing an orator, 
the, the good king and I are both well past our sell-by date, and, and I would guess that the good king has got more teeth in his skull than I have. <laughs> now, my fellow graduands, it's your big day and it, it's my big day. Um, you don't have to sing for your supper, but uh, I'm uh, looking backwards and you're looking forwards, which is the main difference. And I want to just quote you some appropriate words from a, a philosopher. Uh, the Vice-Chancellor mentioned uh, studying philosophy. I know none of you here probably did study philosophy, and I certainly didn't. But uh, some very appropriate words of a, of a Danish 19th century philosopher called Soren Kierkegaard, who is considered to be the father of existentialism. And what he said was, you must live your life looking forwards, but you can only understand your life looking backwards. So I want to take a brief look back to some of the aspect of my life and hope that I can explain a few things to you. Now, I'd like you all to go back six months ago, first of all, all the medical uh, graduates who are here, because I was here as well, when you had what you might call a, a, a sort of day of inspirational talks uh, to here in, in this very place to try to encourage you and particularly encourage those who are coming up behind you not to give up medicine, that there was a light at the end of the tunnel, it was an exciting, challenging career. Now, I know you all weren't all here, particularly the psychologists. I've got two psychologists in the family. They tell me they're very good at uh, this business of uh, sort of transference and getting into other people's minds and ideas, so you all just have to imagine the situation. But we had a, a day of inspiring talks. And to me, the most inspiring uh, speaker was uh, a, a doctor who works all his spare time for Médecins Sans Frontières called David Knott. And some of you in the wider audience may have actually heard him on Desert Island Discs about a month ago. And he was, as I say, to me, a most inspiring person. Now, a few weeks after that, I happened to see in one of the sort of uh, freebie medical magazines that they give away to, to doctors, and you will soon find your letterbox is crammed with all sorts of freebie magazines that come your way, and a rather cynical comment that went like this. It said that all young medical students who aspire to be surgeons think of joining Médecins Sans Frontières. After they've been qualified for five years, they want to become cosmetic plastic surgeons. Now, a very cynical uh, uh, remark, uh, basically not true, but it does have an element of truth in it, because when we're young, we're idealistic, and when we get older, we become more realistic. And it certainly has an element of truth in my own career, because when I was young and idealistic, I went off and worked, as, as Gordon has said, in. Um, in, in Pakistan and then in Nigeria, uh, which were very uh, medically needy places. And then, after some years, an element of realism crept in and I uh, came to work in, in the National Health Service here in Leicester. Now, like uh, most, but not all, uh, NHS consultants, I sort of uh, put my snout in the trough of private practice. Um, uh, some of you may know that uh, the, uh, the private practice, uh, the, the private hospital just down the road, uh, used to be called by the cognoscenti, it used to be called the Golden Nugget. I don't know if it's still called the Golden Nugget, but uh, it perhaps reflects two of the different aspects of medicine, the aspect of service and the aspect of, of uh, 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 making uh, uh, money for ourselves. But when I do what the philosopher said, to look back, try, to try and understand my life, what do I see? Undoubtedly, my richest years financially was the time that I spent here in the NHS, and it's only because of the NHS uh, excellent pension scheme that I can go gallivanting off abroad still at my advanced age. But uh, when I really look back to what was the most valuable and richest time, it wasn't my time here in Leicester, it was my time abroad. Uh, they were the best times as far as 
uh, the, the, the input I had for the community. They were the best and most interesting times as far as the actual work I did. They were the best times as far as the enduring friendships that I've made. And so as I look back to understand my life, those were undoubtedly the best times. Now, uh, Gordon has, has thanked uh, Sheila, my wife, and I would like to add a little personal thanks as well. Uh, while I was a sort of macho surgeon, uh, strutting around doing my things, she had the much harder task of bringing up our family and keeping home. And it wasn't always easy. Uh, in Pakistan, we had a coup and then a civil war. Admittedly, the civil war was the other end of the country to where we were. And when we were in Nigeria, we had at least three coups and several attempted coups. So life wasn't exactly easy for uh, bringing up a family and keeping a home. Now, some of you may be familiar with the uh, child author, Beatrix Potter, and some of you may be familiar with some of her characters. I'm sure you're all familiar with Peter Rabbit. And some of you may be familiar with another of her characters called Mrs. Tittlemouse. Now, Mrs. Tittlemouse was a, was a very hospitable mouse, but she loved to keep everything clean and tidy. And Mrs. Tittlemouse was the, the nickname for Sheila in our family. Um, now, for our last four years in Nigeria, we lived in a what you might call an open plan house. And we had an awful lot of invaders of different sorts. We had uh, numerous termites. Uh, we had numerous other insects. We had, on one occasion, a snake. We had a stray chicken that wasn't house trained and wouldn't go away. And over the course of four years, we have uh, had four separate burglaries. Now, uh, those of you who know the story of Mrs. Tittlemouse will know that she had a nemesis who was a rather large, uh, greedy, uh, messy, untidy toad called Mr. Jackson. Now, I won't, uh, I'll leave you to guess what my nickname in the family was. <laughs> but, so in spite of, of, of all that, I don't honestly think that Sheila can say they were the very best years of her life, but they certainly were good years, and I'm very grateful for her for, for staying with me. So, enough of us. You have got to live your life looking forwards. And so what sort of challenges have you got? Well, you've got some which are worse than in our time and perhaps some that are better. Uh, the ones that are worse is that, first of all, a lot of you have got a mountain of debt that we never had. You've, if you go into hospital practice, you will have this army of managers who will be telling you what to do that we never had. If you go into general practice, there's a, a culture of tick boxes and targets which wasn't around. Uh, you have very, uh, what seemed to me to be very aggressive politicians. We had politicians as well, like our Chancellor, but I'm glad to say a, a very different type of politician who were around in, in our day. But uh, not all is, is, is doom and gloom. Some things are better. You've got run-through training that we never had. We would train for a, a certain level and then have to come back and be, uh, get another job at, at different levels. And you've got some protected time off that we didn't have in our day. Now, it wasn't difficult for me as an ophthalmologist because we didn't have a situation where we'd be up night after night on call. But for many of my colleagues, they, they did indeed have to, maybe they were on call for the weekend and they would not get in their beds for the whole weekend. So uh, please, in spite of its failings, the NHS remains a marvelous institution. Uh, I've seen many other systems throughout the world, and I can tell you, uh, uh, thank the Lord for the NHS, um, both for the staff and for the patients, and particularly for its postgraduate training. Now, I've gone on long enough. I want to finish with one very brief anecdote. Um, before I was going off to Nigeria for four years, um, a very kindly elderly Scottish consultant took me on one side and said, Och mon, you've got to think of your career. Well, that's the best I can do for a Scottish accent. <laughs> but um, I'm afraid I, I, I didn't listen to him. My family will say I never listened to anybody. Um, and uh, I, I didn't think of my career. But the fact that I'm standing here uh, 
uh, talking to you and being given this very great honor shows that my career has looked after itself. So please, follow your dreams, follow your vision, and let your career look after itself. Thank you.